better check real quick, like trying to find out how long I'm speaking. Um, yes, hopefully not too many of you fell asleep during Anthony's presentation. When do you want me to stop? You want me to stop at 210? Okay, what do I need this for then? All right, uh, I don't want to point any fingers, but I did have my laptop charger up here earlier, and now it's gone, which means that one of you, one of you is a thief. What? Oh, okay, never mind then. I was about to do this trick. I'm going to close my eyes, and whoever took it can return it. Like that. All right, 210, thank you. All right, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, if I could change anything at all in the world of apologetics, we we'll be getting Christians to know this, and I'm going to give a bunch of uh, passages from the Quran. There are sort of different levels of interest here. There are dozens of Quran verses that would be relevant. Um, if you don't want to know all of those, learning just one or two would be really, really good. Um, because this is all new information for your Muslim friends. If you're talking to a Muslim, tell them what the Quran says about the Bible. When you go to those passages, this will be completely new information for him. His leaders have never shown him any of this ever in his entire life. And the reason is because as soon as you find out what the Quran says about the Bible, you end up with some serious problems because the Quran contradicts the Bible on some very fundamental doctrines. So the Quran is affirming the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of scriptures that contradict itself. And that's a problem because, and we'll recap this at the end after we go through everything, but think about it, there are two possibilities. Either Christians have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, or we don't. It's one or the other. If we have the, ins if we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, if this is the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because Islam contradicts this book. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false. Because Islam, as we're about to see, affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our book. So if we have the word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the word of God, Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. That's a pretty big problem in, in, in my book, not, not this one, no. All right. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and go through some passages, and we'll see what the Quran says about the Bible. And um, eventually we'll get to what I regard as the actual view of the Quran in the context of other scriptures that you get from the Quran. And then we'll look at the two most popular uh, objections to this. So, first on inspiration. Your average Muslim does know that, according to Islam, the books of the Jews and the Christians were supposedly inspired by Allah. That's why they say corrupted. That's why they say corrupted and don't just say that they were never the word of God or something like that. Because you can talk to an atheist. He doesn't believe, he doesn't have to believe that your scriptures been corrupted. He just doesn't believe they were ever from God. He could say, yes, no, you, you've got the... You, You've got the same scriptures that you've always had. They're just not from God. In Islam, your average Muslim does know this little part, and this is pretty much the only part that your average Muslim will know. He doesn't know the verse. He doesn't know the verses. He doesn't know where it comes from, but he does know that about his religion. So Surah 3, verses 3 to 4. He, Allah, has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it. And he revealed the Torah and the gospel aforetime, a guidance for mankind, and he revealed the criterion. Now, fortunately, this is the only time I will say, fortunately, I look out and I see uh, Brother Osama Dakdok here. But this one time I'm going to say, fortunately, I see Brother Osama here. Brother Osama. That which is before it. I look at that and it makes it sound like he verified something, you know, from, from a long time ago. And Muslims would read that and say, ah, yes, he's saying something, you know, he, 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 uh, he, yes, he's verifying that the scriptures were once, once upon a time, revealed. Uh, but I happen to know that that which is before it there, in Arabic, 
is Baina Yadehi. Now, what does Baina Yadehi actually mean in Arabic? Baina Yadehi means between his hands or between its hands, and idiom as an idiom, it refers to something that is in its presence, still still existing. So in Arabic, this is actually saying that the Quran is affirming the scriptures that are still in its presence or in his presence. And so already, already, even in a verse that's just about the inspiration, you already start seeing a problem with the idea that the Quran views these other scriptures as corrupt. So uh, verifying that which is before it, according to this translation, and he revealed the Torah and the gospel aforetime, a guidance for mankind. Notice, even there, the Torah and the gospel were revealed as a guidance for mankind. Okay, did the apostle Paul corrupt them? It wouldn't make sense. What, what the apostle, Allah wanted to, I would really want to guide mankind with this. Oh, no, the apostle Paul overpowered me. Kind of makes your God sound weak if now if you're saying that, that he really, really wanted to do this, but then someone corrupted it. And he revealed the criterion. Now, I just wanted a couple more verses because the phrase Baina Yadehi occurs over and over again, talking about what the Quran is saying about the previous scriptures. Surah 6, verse 92, and this, the Quran, is a blessed book which we have sent down, confirming that which is Baina Yadehi, confirming that which is in its presence, referring to the previous scriptures, saying that it's confirming them. Surah 10, verse 37, and this Quran is not such as could ever be produced by other than Allah, but it is a confirmation of that which is Baina Yadehi, confirmation of that which is uh, in its presence. Again, still referring to the previous scriptures as something in its presence. Between his hands. Again, literally, literally between his hands, but something that's still there. So 35, 31. And that which we have revealed to you of the book, that is the truth, verifying that which is Baina Yadehi. Surah 46, verse 30, they say, O our people, verily, we have heard a book, the Quran, sent down after Moses, verifying what is Baina Yadehi. So, th and by the way, there's, there are a bunch more of these, but the Quran over, and if you, want the literal, if you want a literal translation, Osama's Quran is right out there, and you translate this literally, right? Yeah, word for word, okay. So, uh, sent down after Moses, verifying what is Baina Yadehi. So, uh, already, the point is, uh, these verses in a, in a standard English translation, you wouldn't see this because it, ju it just gets translated as what is before it. Because notice, before it is ambiguous. You can mean before it in time, but before it could also mean like right in front of you, right before it. And so you could justify the translation, but yeah. Surah 7, verse 157. So I mentioned that there, if you just wanted to learn a couple, if you want to learn all these, that's cool. If you just wanted to pick a couple, to learn, 7, 157 is a very, very good one. That would be in the top couple. Uh, this is a much longer verse, but uh, the first part here is uh, the relevant part. Surah 7, verse 157. Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written down with them in the Torah and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. So this is the main basis for the Muslim claim that m we find Muhammad in the Bible. We find Muhammad in the Torah and the gospel. So... This is why Muslims are desperate to find prophecies about Muhammad in the Bible. The Quran says they're there. But notice, this is talking about us. Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find written down with them in the Torah and the gospel. So this is praising Jews and Christians who would say, aha, we find Muhammad in our Bible. Whom they find written down with them in the Torah and the gospel. That kind of sounds like they have the Torah and the gospel, right? And if we're taking it, if we're supposed to take it seriously, in its prophecies, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say, oh yeah, and it's corrupt. If it was corrupt, why would you be appealing to it? And if you believe parts of, if you believe parts of it were corrupt, how do you know that the parts that are supposedly about Muhammad aren't corrupt too? It makes very little sense to say, you really want to know that I'm a true prophet? Go to that corrupt book over there. But that's, that's what Muslims really think that the Quran is claiming. And that's why they've got this awkward position of, Hey, why should we believe in Muhammad? Because look at all these biblical prophecies. Wait, the book you say is corrupt? Yeah, that book. Weird, weird stuff. But notice, it's their book that puts them in this position. Preservation. 
Surah 6, 114 to 115. Shall I, then seek a <clears throat> shall I then seek a judge other than Allah? And he it is who has revealed to you the book made plain. And those to whom we have given the book know that it is revealed by your Lord with truth. Therefore, you should not be of the disputers. And the word of your Lord has been accomplished truly and justly. There is none who can change his words, and he is the hearing, the knowing. Uh, according to this passage of the Quran, so we are, we've already seen that the Torah and the gospel are the words of Allah. According to this verse, who can change the words of Allah? This, this says no one. None who can change his words. Wait, not the Apostle Paul? Not the Council of Nicaea? No, you do have passages that are like changing Allah's decree. This is in the context specifically of talking about a book, and it says no one can change his words. Now, the Muslim response here would be, ah, well, if it's not talking about his decree, then it's just talking about the Quran. It does not say no one can change, it, can change the Quran. It says no one can change his words. And according to the Quran, the Torah and the gospel are Allah's words. So when Mus Muslims, will act, Muslims will sit there and read this, and I will say, according to that, no one can change his words. No, that just means the Quran. His other words are, were changed. Say, oh, so people can change his words. You're, you're completely saying, that you're saying the exact, the literal, you are literally saying the exact opposite of what your God says. No one can change his words. Oh, yes, but most of his words could be changed. <laughs> it's just weird stuff, but here we are. Again, their book puts them in this position. Same thing, sir, 18 verse 27. In fact, if you wanted, to, this, this says the same thing as the other one. Um, but if you wanted to learn one of these, 18, I go with 1827, it's easy to memorize. It's like a year. Back in 1827, I read this verse. And recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words, except the Apostle Paul. And you shall not find any refuge besides him. See, sounds like, sounds like, really sounds like Allah is saying people can't change his words. And we actually see this soon in Abu Dawud 44, 49. This is, a, this is a long hadith. I'm giving you the relevant portion. I'll, give you the, I'll, I'll just give you the actual story real quick, and then we'll read this little passage. But some Jews come to Muhammad, who's a political leader by now. The Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute. And they ask him to judge. And we're, we're about to read the, the Quran verse that was revealed in reference to this here in a moment. But Allah basically tells Muhammad, why are the Jews coming to you when they've already got the Torah? They don't need you, they've got the Torah. And so the Jews still want Muhammad to judge the, judge the dispute. And back then they would, the judge would sit on a, a judgment cushion to signify that he is the judge in this case. Muhammad uh, gets off the cushion, puts the Torah on the cushion. So let's see what he says. So they set out a cushion for the messenger of Allah, signifying that he's the judge of this dispute, and he sat on it. Then he said, bring me the Torah, talking to the Jews, bring me the Torah. It was brought, and he took the cushion from beneath him and placed the Torah on it and said, I believe in you and in the one who revealed you. That sounds like, does that sound like he thought it was corrupt? If, if it was a corrupt book, I'd, I, I believe in some of you, and, you know, I believe that, you know, originally a long time ago, no, I he's talking sp to a specific copy of the Torah in the seventh century. We have copies from before that. We've got the Dead Sea Scrolls. We know what it said. Doesn't make a lot of sense. So, and if you think about a corrupt book, would you affirm a book that is corrupt, that has some true teachings in it? No, because what Muslims believe about the Bible is pretty much what I believe about like what the Quran actually is. I believe the Quran is a corrupt corruption of earlier true things. Like there are things in the Quran that I agree with because Muhammad stole things from the Bible, the Christian scriptures, the Jewish scriptures. He stole a bunch of things. So it's a corruption. It's what they accuse our book of being. That's what their book is. It would never cross my mind to say, oh, Quran, I affirm you and in the one who revealed you. It's like, no, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to do that with a corrupt book. Jamiat Termidi, 2653. So this is, a, this is a hadith, but this is giving Muhammad's perspective. So there we have Muhammad's perspective on the Torah. Here he mentions the Torah and the gospel. Jamia Termidi 2653, we were with the prophet when he raised his sight to the sky. Then he said, this is the time when knowledge is to be taken from the people until what remains of it shall not amount to anything. So Ziad bin Labid al-Ansari said, how will it be taken from us while we recite the Quran? Notice the objection. Muhammad, you're saying knowledge is going to be taken from your community. How's that possible? We've got the Quran. 
by Allah, we recite it and our women and children recite it. We're all reciting the Quran. How can knowledge depart from us? He said, may you be bereaved of your mother, Ozia. <laughs> Pretty rough for a guy saying, hey, we have the Quran. It's so great. <laughs> Tell Muhammad response. I used to consider you among the fuqaha. These are, these are the uh, Islamic jurists, the scholars. I used to consider you among that. But this horrible, evil thing you said is making me change my mind. I used to consider you among the fuqaha of the people of al Medina. The Torah and the gospel are with the Jews and the Christians, but what do they avail of it? Muhammad's response makes zero sense if he thought the Torah and the gospel were corrupted. Because what he's saying to, what he's saying to Ziyad here is just because you ha still have the Quran does not mean knowledge is going to pass, pass away. Having the, having the actual text does not mean that you know it. Even reciting it does not mean you have all of the knowledge of it. I'm saying the knowledge is going to pass away from you in spite of you having it. That makes no sense if he believed the Torah and the gospel are corrupted because then knowledge would have passed away from the Jews and the Christians because they have corrupt books. He's saying, no, 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 look at them and now you'll understand what I mean. This only makes sense if he thought the Jews and the Christians have reliable scriptures from God still, but we're not really following them. We're not really understanding them. So they don't have corrupt books. It doesn't make any sense if he thought their, their books were corrupt. All right, now for the authority. So we went through inspiration. That was easy. Went through preservation. All sorts of reasons to think that the Quran is affirming. The Quran and Muhammad affirmed the preservation of the Torah and the gospel. What about the authority here? Surah so 5, verse 43, this is the verse I mentioned a moment ago. This is Allah's response to Jews coming to Muhammad saying, we need you, political leader here, to judge this dispute. Allah says, why do they come to you for judgment, O Muhammad, when they have the Torah before them? Wherein is the judgment of Allah? Yet they turn back after that, and these are not the believers. So even though they have it, they're turning away from it. They're coming to you. And so Allah is telling Muhammad, this is what he tells him in context, and this is the whole, that's why we read the hadith. Allah and Muhammad's response is, no, you guys judge by the Torah. You do not come to Muhammad. The Torah is your judge. You judge by that. Does that make sense if they, again, does that make sense if Allah and Muhammad thought the Torah was corrupt? No. You'd be saying, of course you need to come to Muhammad because you have corrupt scriptures. Good job. Not what Allah and Muhammad said. A few verses later, Surah 5, verse 47. So that's what Jews are supposed to judge by. And then Allah just tosses this in too. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. Now think about this. This would be another one. So Surah 7, verse 157. Matter of fact, if I had to pick three, I would go Surah 7, verse 157, because it specifically says that Jews and Christians during the time of Muhammad had the Torah and the gospel. Probably 18, uh, 1827, which says that no one can change Allah's words. And then 547, where Allah commands Christians to judge, not by the Quran, but by the gospel, which does not make sense if Christians, and, uh, Christians didn't have a reliable gospel. If we had a corrupt gospel, it doesn't make sense to say that's what you're supposed to judge by. And notice it says, if we don't, if we refuse to judge by the gospel, we're rebels. We're no better than those who rebel. What do our Muslim friends tell us? Don't judge by the gospel. It's corrupt. Allah says, if you don't judge by that gospel, you're condemned. Muslims, don't judge by the gospel. They say the exact opposite of what their God says in their own book. And again, you could walk up to 10 Muslim friends. 10, 10 out of 10 of your Muslim friends have not read this before. They do not know it's here. Same chapter, Surah 5, verse 68. Say, O people of the book, this is talking to Jews and Christians, Say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. Very, very odd thing to say if he thought the Torah and the gospel were corrupted. I, I would not give Muslims advice and say, Muslims, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand upon the Quran. I don't want you standing upon the Quran. I mean, you know, maybe physically or something like that, but um, not like intellectually, not like living your life by it. So Allah, I mean, Allah over and over again, he condemns Jews and Christians for not following our scriptures. 
if we had corrupt scriptures, he should be praising us for not following our scriptures and saying, yes, that's why you need Muhammad, not what he says. In fact, so we've just seen that according to the Quran, and by the way, there, there, there are many more passages like this, but according to the Quran, the Torah is still authoritative for Jews. The gospel is still authoritative for Christians, so much so, we have no other ground to stand upon. He doesn't say, oh yeah, make sure you stand upon the Quran. We still have to stand upon the Torah and the gospel, so they're still authoritative. What's interesting is that according to the Quran, the Torah and the gospel were, were authoritative even over Muhammad's revelations. Once upon a time, Muhammad started having doubts about whether his revelations were from God, and this is Allah's response. This is Allah's response to Muhammad. He's speaking directly to Muhammad here. And Allah says to Muhammad, but if you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, notice the we there, Anthony loves that one, ask those who read the book before you. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. Muhammad, you're doubting the revelations you're getting? Well, here's what you need to do. Go to the people of the book. Ask them if your revelations line up with theirs, and you will, that's how you will see that you have the truth. Does that make sense if the Torah and the gospel were corrupt? No, because then the only way the Quran would line up with a corrupt book is if the Quran itself was a corruption. I, really, uh, I think it's really odd to think that that's what Allah is saying here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Nice, those who are reading it. So, we've got inspiration, preservation, and authority, and we've already seen that all of these scriptures are supposedly authoritative for the groups that have them. So what is the, what is the actual takeaway message that you get from the Quran? Like if you sit down and you don't go with what this Muslim scholar says or that Muslim uh, preacher says, and you just read the, if you were to sit in a room and just read the Quran, without knowing what you're supposed to believe about the Torah and the gospel, and you just read the Quran all the way through, and then you said, what is this book saying about the Torah and the gospel? You can, you, you can put together what the Quran's actual perspective is. So, we'll look at a couple real, real quick. Surah 46, verse 12. And before this, before the Quran, was the book of Moses as a guide and a mercy. And this book, the Quran, confirms it in the Arabic language to admonish the unjust and as glad tidings to those who do right. The Quran is confirming other revelations in Arabic to admonish the unjust and as glad tidings. So people who understand Arabic, the Quran is confirming things in Arabic for Arabic speakers. Surah 42, verse 7. And thus have we revealed to you an Arabic Quran that you may warn the mother city, supposedly Mecca, and those around it. So why is, what's the purpose of the Quran? He's talking to Muhammad. We have revealed the, the Arabic Quran so that you can warn the people of Mecca and those around it, so Arab speakers. And that you may give warning of the day of gathering together wherein is no doubt. A party shall be in the garden and another party in the burning fire. There are people, the Arabs, who need this revelation to be warned about the judgment and so on, and they need something in their own language. That's what the Quran is for. And check out this passage. Surah 6, 155 to 157. And this Quran is a book we have revealed as a blessing. Therefore, follow it and guard against evil, that mercy may be shown to you. Lest you should say, the book was only revealed to two parties before us, so Jews and Christians, and we were truly unaware of what they read. Or lest you should say, if the book had been revealed to us, we would certainly have been better guided than they. Look at what this is saying. So you had Arabs. The Arabs didn't have a revelation in their own language. So according to the Quran, the Quran is the revelation in Arabic. It confirms the other scriptures in the other languages. It's for them so that they won't have an, that they won't have an excuse. They won't have an excuse on judgment day to say, if only we'd been given the book like the Jews were given. Or if only we'd been given a book 
like the Christians were given, then we would have, we would have served uh, Allah really well. But we didn't have a book in our own language. So in order to prevent that kind of objection, Allah gave them a revelation in their own language. And what you get from the actual Quran is Allah has sent prophets into all the world. Allah sent prophets to every group in the world. The last people to get their revelation were the Arabs. That's why Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. That's why Muhammad is the final prophet. They were the last people to get their revelation. Once they had their revelation, now everyone had their prophet, everyone had their revelation. And you're supposed to judge by the revelation that you had. That's why when Jews come to Muhammad, hey Muhammad, settle this dispute for us. No, 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 no. You judge by the Torah, that's for you. You Christians, you judge by the gospel. Arabs, you judge by the Quran. That's the revelation in your language. That was the view of the, that was the view, that was the Quranic view of the other scriptures. Very, very difficult to find any Muslim in the world who believes anything like this anymore. Why? Because eventually they went to the Torah and the gospel thinking, oh, this is going to line up perfectly with our scriptures because that's what Allah says. Wrong. It was all wrong. So it wasn't, what they, it wasn't what Allah and Muhammad said was going to be there. And so, oh, must be corrupt. Why would you say corrupt? Why wouldn't you say Allah obviously had no clue what he's talking about? Because by the time they find out, they would get their heads chopped off for that sort of thing. So, okay, it's corrupt. It's the only, it's the only, it's the only thing I can say without getting my head chopped off. But notice how strange that is, right? Allah is saying no one can change his words. They've got the books. They're supposed to judge by those books. You go to those books, wait a minute, this doesn't line up with Islam at all. Oh, then their books are corrupt. Why don't you say that? So notice the, the, the Islamic understanding of various passages. Earlier, we went through the claims of Jesus, showing that Jesus, according to both the Quran and, and the Old Testament, Jesus was making claims that only God should be making. And he did it over and over and over and over and over again. Once you put it all together, especially if you in include uh, Jesus being crucified, Jesus rising from the dead, and so on, these contradict Islam as well. But once you include those, the only possible response from Muslims is, your book's been corrupted. Because if you're, if you're saying, no, your book hasn't been corrupted, you, the only thing you can do is just say, Jesus is the worst communicator ever. But that's kind of what they say about Allah. If, the, if these passages that we just went through are Allah trying to tell Jews and Christians, your scriptures have been corrupted, don't go to them, don't trust them, you need the Quran. If that's Allah, I mean, if, if Allah in these passages is trying to tell Jews and Christians that their scriptures are corrupted, Allah is the absolute worst communicator in, the, in all of history. Because he's telling people, your books are the inspired, preserved, author authoritative word of God, when he actually meant they were eh, originally inspired, but not, definitely not preserved and definitely not still authoritative. The Quran is the only thing like that. And so it's just a, it's a very, it's an awkward position for Muslims to be in, that their book affirms our book and our book contradicts their book. That puts them, that's why we call it the Islamic dilemma. Because again, only two possibilities. We have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God or we don't. If we have it, Islam is false. If we don't have it, Islam is false. Either way, Islam is false. And when we ask, and I've asked repeatedly, I've, I've uh, had debates on this and so on, when we ask, where does the Quran say that the Jewish and Christian scriptures have been corrupted? Where does it even hint at that? There are a few verses. I'm going to give you the, the top two, the top two, the two main ones right now. And the, one, the first one is by far, like 90% of the time, if you ask Muslims where the Quran says that the Torah and the gospel were corrupted, uh, you get this one. Surah 2, verse 79. Woe then to those who write the book with their hands and then say, this is from Allah, so that they may take for it a small price. Therefore woe, therefore, woe to them for what their hands have written, and woe to them for what, their, uh, for what they earn. They say, aha, looky here. It says, woe to those who write the book with their own hands, and then say, this is from Allah. Say, see, that's talking about the Bible. It's talking about the Torah, the gospel. And we'll be like, okay, so you're saying this contradicts everything else that the, that the Quran says about the scriptures of the Jews and Christians? Because that's interesting. But notice, it, it, you can go to the Muslim commentaries, you get, all sorts of, you get all sorts of interpretations on this from Muslims. Some of them say that people were having, because in, in context, this is a, Surah 2 deals a lot with Jews. And in context, Jews would be the only group that you could even accuse of this here. 
uh, the, they're the only ones in the context you could point to and say he's talking to Jews here. But some of the commentaries you get are that Jews were being asked to um, write portions of the book as like blessings for people, and that they, but that they were charging money for it so that they're earning money by writing these little bits for, for people and so on. And you have uh, some commentators who say that because the prophecies of Muhammad are so clear in the Torah, some Jews wrote a false prophecy that didn't sound anything like Muhammad and said, this is the, this is the description of the prophet who's to come. And then they go around showing Muslims, oh, look, I got a page here, and it doesn't sound like Muhammad at all, you see? And they're saying, they say that's what it's saying right here. But notice, even if you, even if you go with the idea, so notice, in either one of those cases, neither one of those cases is a copy of the Torah being corrupted. And if you have ever seen Jews, with a, Orthodox Jews, with a copy of the Torah, you know that's not the sort of thing they're going to mess with. But suppose, suppose this verse was actually saying what a Muslim thinks it's saying, that this is actually saying, Jews sat down and rewrote the Torah. Jews in Arabia sat down and rewrote the Torah to sort of throw Muslim, I mean, throw people off the trail that the Torah is talking about Muhammad. Um, is that going to change the Torah in Egypt? Is that going to change the copies of the Torah in Europe? Is that going to change the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were still in a cave and weren't going to be found for a long, long time? No, it's impossible. You can't, you, you, them, if they were to make changes there, that would not change copies of the Torah from around the world. It's the same thing. Right now, I could take the Quran and I could write, a, I could make a bunch of changes in the Quran. That doesn't change the Quran around the world. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make an impact. And so, if you ignored everything else the Quran said about the Torah and just went with this, even this isn't saying that, that the Torah has been corrupted. If you include everything else that the Quran says about the Torah, there's no way this is referring to corruption. And it's, this is especially true if you just read Surah 2. Over and over and over again in Surah 2, Allah says that he's confirming what the Jews still have with them. Doesn't make sense if he thought they had corrupted it. And just a few verses later after this, Allah warns the Jews and says, don't judge by parts of your book and ignore others. Well, that's exactly what Muslims tell us to do. So Allah says, whatever you do, don't judge by parts of the Torah and ignore others. That makes no sense if he thought that parts of it were corrupted, because if parts of it were corrupted, then he definitely shouldn't be judging by those parts. So that doesn't make any sense. Um, and, he, and, of course, notice that has nothing to do with the gospel there. So even if it were referring somehow to the corruption of the Torah, gospel has nothing to do with that passage. And then Surah 3, verse 78, this is the other main one. And this one, all you have to do is actually read it to see what it's saying. And lo, there's a party of them who distort the scripture with their tongues, that you may think that what they say is from the scripture, when it says, uh, when it is not from the scripture. And they say it is from Allah, when it is not from Allah. And they speak a lie concerning Allah knowingly. Notice that in, they speak a lie concerning Allah knowingly. That means you know what the scripture actually says, and you're speaking a lie about it knowingly. That means you still have the reliable scripture. But notice what it's actually saying. And lo, there is a party of them who distort the scripture, what? With their pens? Their tongues. This is about their speech. They're misrepresenting what the scripture says. And whenever Muslims, I, I ask Muslims, so that means the text has been corrupted? They go, yeah. I say, are there Muslims who misrepresent the Quran with their, with their mouths? Yes, of course. She is. I go, okay, so the Quran's been corrupted. Because right? you said if you, if you misrepresent it with your speech, then, then, then the book has been corrupted, and then they have to change it. So, so anyway, if you go with what the Quran says, uh, over and over again, it affirms the inspiration, preservation, authority of our book. The, the main two passages that they can go to to try and argue that our scriptures were actually corrupted. One, this one, Surah 378 gives you the actual perspective. Jews and Christians misrepresent what it says. They, pr they present false ideas about what the book says. Does not condemn the book. And the other one, Surah 279, if you read the chapter in context, let alone the entire Quran, there's no way that's talking about the corruption of a text. No one can change Allah's words. So this leaves our Muslim friends with a dilemma. Just imagine, imagine if Christians learned this. And since, since we're Christians and we would tend to focus more on the gospel, one fun challenge to give to your Muslim friends, hey, the Quran only talks about the gospel 12 times. It's 12 verses that mention the gospel. 
you can sit down with your Muslim friends and say, we'll go through all 12 verses that re refer to the gospel, the scripture of the Jews and Christians, I mean, the scripture of the Christians. We'll go through all of them. You show me one word that even slightly hints, that even slightly hints at the corruption. A few years ago, I put out a video and I said, I will bow down and recite the Shahada. You show me one word in the Quran that says that the gospel has been corrupted. Matter of fact, I'll give you all the verses right now because I think I still remember them. We'll see. Uh, Surah 3, verse 3. Some of them we read. If you, want, if you want all the verses that mention the gospel, Surah 3, verse 3. Surah 3, verse 48. Surah 3, verse 65. Surah 5, verse 46. Surah 5, verse 47. Surah 5, verse 60. Six, Surah 5, verse 68, Surah 5, verse 110, Surah 7, verse 157, Surah 9, verse 111, Surah 48, verse 29, and Surah 57, verse 27. That's every, that's all 12 references to the Torah, I mean to the gospel. Show me one, one hint in there that the gospel has been corrupted. And then just, then you can just ask your Muslim friends, do you think Allah is the worst communicator ever? If all he does when he wants to condemn our book is tell us that we have to judge by our book, that our book is great, that our book, no one can change his words and so on. Do you are, you are you really saying that? And hopefully you can get your Muslim friend to understand the problem. Because if his book is affirming our book, then when you go to the book, when you go to our book, when you go to the Bible, you show him that Jesus is the divine son of God who died on the cross and rose from the dead. When you show him that the God of the Bible is Trinitarian, there's no way out. There is absolutely no way out. It's, hey, here's what it says. Here's what we got. How do you get out of this? You can't say it's corrupt because your book doesn't let you say that. So where are you going? Where are you going? You could, re you, you could in theory, reject both. You, you could reject the Bible and reject the Quran, but you just can't accept the Quran while denying the Bible. And that is, that is a great message to get across. So uh, learn at least, at least a couple of those verses uh, use them online. Some people think they have to learn everything. No, you could learn one thing and just share that a lot. You could learn one ver you could learn one relevant verse, like Surah 5, verse 47, and share that all over Twitter. If a bunch of Christians are doing that, eventually Muslims get, get the point. We think you can spend years doing apologetics and so on and think it's not making a difference. Um, those of you who've been following, you've been following, right? We, so for years we tell them, no, the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved. They never listen, and then eventually say, okay, it hasn't been perfectly preserved. It happens. It takes decades. For years, we told them about Muhammad and Aisha. They, also, they said we're liars for decades. And then, now they, now they admit it. For years, we told them the scientific miracles are bogus. Now they admit it. And so this is what's happening. So it takes time. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort. But even though progress is slow, there is still progress.